Okay, so this is picking up with part two of the lecture. Um, if you wonder what happened there and why it kind of just sort of stopped, honestly, the camera died, but I think it's a good division point where we can continue moving on in talking about, you know, how the errors of the principle have changed, how the errors of school have changed, and kind of what's expected on, of today's principle. Um, the big argument that I've made is that today's principles can't get rid of what they're responsible for. There are more opportunities. The job function keeps getting harder. If you have time and you can read Dan Lorty's The Principle, it's one of the best ones that can give you an example on what today's principles are expected to do. So, you know, I always ask this in a face-to-face -face class. I always ask, um, you know, what in your buildings, what are you tasked with, with, the, with the most? And I find that number one is really the, in, the interpersonal relations that you have. Whether or not it be with students, whether or not it be with um, parents, that you're being tasked more for interpersonal relationships than anything else. I also find that paperwork, data, and meetings is up here too. But when we look at the second thing where there are responsibilities that are pushed aside, I think those are classroom observations, walkthroughs, any of the fun things that really were why you went into being a principal in the first place. So we have a foundation um, of the history of the principalship, the history of education. So now we can speak briefly about um, different types of education traditional versus progressive education and how that relates to organizations. So you all know that we had traditional, traditional education was really what things looked like in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s. It was drill, memorization, teachers were authority, and formal instruction, instructional methods. Um, to contemporize this, this is the notion of direct instruction in schools, which is a federal perspective. Direct instruction in schools really comes from the federal government more than anything else. So what's good about traditional education? Well, honestly, everybody gets the same type of education. You can be consistent. If, uh, if, 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 if Sally Smith was moving from Oklahoma to Iowa, she'd be at the same place in fourth grade in Iowa that she was in Oklahoma. The bad thing about it, it doesn't allow for teacher freedom and teacher autonomy. It can also make this teaching profession itself much less attractive. Certain types of schools and students do benefit from traditional education. If you have a group of students that are potentially, they, that are, that are potentially struggling in, in a school setting, traditional education might help. It might raise their levels. It might move them from being a lower student to a mid-level student. But the mid to top level students don't show much gains in a traditional education system. Which brings us to the notion of progressive education. When you hear progressive education, I want you to think of John Dewey, because John Dewey was really the person who pushed this movement. He wanted education to be individualized for all. Um, the problem with that is, is then you have a teacher being responsible for the individual support of 30 different students. Progressive education is doctoral studies, because all of you have your own dissertation topics. You can choose what you do when you do it, and you can use the material that's been given to you to help you determine it. This class is progressive education, because what we do in here really contributes to what you could be doing for your writing, for your research, for your doctorate, and it's why I think this is a good idea. You want group discussion and classroom informality, and you want people to be able to learn and grow themselves. The good thing about it, it's individualized. Everybody is happy in a progressive education system, and truthfully, they really are happy in a progressive education system um, because their individual needs are being met and they're being helped and facilitated. The bad thing about progressive education is the fact that you essentially have an education system where the teacher is responsible for 30 people. Inevitably, somebody's going to be left behind, and the teacher can't be designing lessons for everybody individually. And if you don't believe me on that, look at Montessori schools, because that's what I did for early childhood education. I really looked at their impact and their effect, and the work that the teachers had to do in those schools was crazy. Certain students, schools, and types benefit from progressive education. Honestly, it's your gifted students. Your, gift, your gifted students will benefit the most from a progressive education system. They're the ones that need it. They're the ones that really have a lot to gain from it. And progressive education is fantastic for them. So 
more importantly, because everything that we think about in this class, you need to think about who does it impact? Who are the end results? So how does this impact students? Well, students in progressive education would have the freedom to choose what they want. The negative is, what if the students were making bad choices? For teachers, this gives them more work in progressive education. Direct instruction is easy. If I wanted, to, if I you know wanted to show you a system that we used back in Pennsylvania, we use something called Success for All. It was scripted learning. All somebody had to do was memorize a script, read it, and and that was that. That was um, that was a traditional view of scripted learning. Principals. Um, Principals know what's going on in a traditional education system. They have measurables and they have tangibles, and they know what those measurables and tangibles look like. They can judge as to how student A is doing versus student D. Um, you can't really do that in progressive education. Superintendents, you get more data, you get a bottom line. Parents, parents just want their kids to do well, and that's the one good thing about kind of the relationship with parents. How the school looks and how the school performs is the main thing that, that parent, um, the parents want. And yes, you know, basically these advantages are for each different stakeholder, and I think it's really, you know, it's really dependent on the system and the organization itself. So progressive education was really big in the 1870s to 1940s um, because we wanted people to have their own freedoms and choices. There was a novel that was published called The Jungle that Upton Sinclair wrote about poor industrialization and bad working conditions. This did a lot to change working conditions, but it also helped really um, to, to empower schools to provide children with the opportunities to have their own choice, which I think was great. So the 1950s, um, the NEA, the National Education Association, and the federal level of education said we need vocational education for students that weren't going to college. I love vocational education. I think it's an awesome idea. Here's the negative behind what happened. It meant the tracking was also going to exist as well because if a student was poor performing, they simply just put them in the vocational trade. That's a negative and, and that can be a bad thing itself. Then we had, we had the, you know, the whole debate over Sputnik and the Russian satellite invasion. Um, Sputnik was launched by the Soviet Union on October 4th, 1957. Um, basically, Americans were scared to death, and it changed how education was looked back to traditionalism. We have to do reading, writing, and, and mathematics because this is what we need to do to compete with the Russians. But I always stress this, and if I was teaching an intro to computers in education, I would say the same thing. Um, it, it, the Soviets put all of their money in, in space. And we put our money in space, but we also put it in space telecommunications. It's what made Americans be able to take that money and diversify it, where the Russians almost completely collapsed because of it. So yes, there was a backlash, but that was one of the reasons. Then we had the Vietnam War. Um, the Vietnam War led to a revolution back to progressive education. Savage inequalities, I hope you looked at this in your school reform classes, it's historically one of the most important readings on education. Um, really, how there were differences in, in, in the Boston public schools and how you could reform them and how they were initially discriminatory in, in what that looked like. But the Vietnam War was something that Vietnam War was something that, 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 that really said, hey, we don't want to militarize our schools. We want to give people individual freedoms and choices as they need. So a couple of things you need to know. Urban education dictates everything. I come from a suburban system and a rural system. I've never worked in an urban school in my life, but all of the research really comes from urban education and urban schools. So that's where the trends are right now. When you read research articles, they're almost always going to be about urban situations. So depending on your context, that might help you, but it might be something that, you know, that might hurt you more than anything else. So, David Berliner and Bruce Biddle looked at, you know, was there really a crisis in our schools? Basically said that, you know, the myth that our achievement has declined is not true. Our college students, their performance has not declined, and it hasn't. But the time invested in school has. So if you would say that relates to performance, that's up to you. But I would argue that you know we have more students that aren't getting out in four years, they're getting out in five and six, but the performance is actually better. Um, the United States does not spend a lot more money on its schools than other nations do, trust me. 
Um, knowing what the European Union spends and knowing what uh, Southeast Asia does, they spend a ton of money on their schools. Um, how do you measure money in school performance? Um, that's a challenge as well. So, you know, we, we look, um, we, we look at the history of education, and I agree with this quote, that's why I put it in there. Schools ain't what they used to be and probably never were. Um, schools really weren't the way that they were historically presented, um, and they're not going to be that way again as well. So organizational theorists, how they look at schools, um, most of them really look at the notion of intelligence. Um, if you look at, you know, if you understand fun functions and capabilities in an organization, it's putting the right people that have the right frames of intelligence in the right locations. The first intelligence test was, de was developed by Alfred Binet, um, and it was distributed and quantified is what an IQ test, um, what an IQ test is, and what an IQ test looks at. So, when we talk about this and we relate it to theory, we look at Howard Gardner. And Howard Gardner just received the Brock Prize in International Education for 2014. And his work really came from the work of Piaget, Bruner, and Goleman. Um, but he took the fact that we have certain intelligences and he was able to quantify them and build them into um, eight different types of intelligences. So I borrow this. You can look at this on your own, but if you remember from intro to ed, way back in the day when all of you had to take it, you had to learn about Garner's multiple intelligences. And I taught this in every single education class that I've ever taught in my life, and I probably will for the rest of my life. Um, there are eight of them. Linguistic is speaking and writing, so really that's your English intelligence. Logical mathematical is mathematical and scientific in inquiry, so I would say that's your STEM intelligence. Spatial intelligence, um, really it's to make sense of space and make sense of the, wor the world. I call this your Tetris intelligence, if you've ever played the video game Tetris, that's spatial intelligence. Musical intelligence is if you know and you understand music, and music can help you learn other things. Bodily kinesthetic intelligence, um, this is, these are people that are athletically inclined and athletically gifted, and they can use their body to help them solve problems. Interpersonal people understand other people. Intrapersonal people understand themselves. And naturalistic intelligence, it's people that understand nature, understand the world, and are more drawn to environmental education and outside things. So I, I gave you a brief overview, but I'm going to talk about each one of these just a little bit more. Um, you can obviously look these up on your own. You've, you know, you've, you've heard this multiple times in your other classes. But for linguistic intelligence, um, English is favored the most. But we have things like writing across the curriculum, um, where there's actual, actual writing activities done in every single class. And that's still common across the United States. So logical and mathematical, um, these are people that have high skills in, in mathematics and science. They're more likely to perform high-level math functions um, and can explain them. Um, I feel that schools, good schools, will provide appropriate and adequate development for math. Um, they just have to make sure that they're relating to the students who need it and they're giving them what they can to help. Um, spatial intelligence, um, these are your designers, your artists, these are the ones that have a sense of what the world looks like. Like I said, I call this your Tetris intelligence because they know where things go and where things belong. Um, and you obviously know that if an artist was given this smart board as a canvas to paint, what areas would they paint, what, they, what would they do with it? Try to make sure that you, know, you don't dissuade these students because they've been told a lot of the times they're least important. Um, musical intelligence, these are people that are good at singing or playing a musical instrument. One of the things that I always suggested is that some people work better um, while they're, while they're you know, listening to music. I've never not encouraged headphones when people were doing computer work or typing or coding. Um, it helps them complete tasks while listening to music as well. So one of the things you can do with bodily kinesthetic intelligence, take breaks and allow the class to stretch out. Allow the class to just you know, take a minute, stretch, take a minute, stretch out. Um, lead an active lifestyle. If they need to move around and be physically active, you give them the right and the opportunity to do that. Stretch breaks and brain breaks are a great thing in schools. So interpersonal intelligence, these are the ones that prefer group work. All of you know that your teachers in an effective, um, an effective classroom as you go observe them should be engaging their students in group work. 
and there should be measurables. The key is you need to make sure who's speaking and who's being the motivating people um, are the ones that are, that are rotated in and people with strong social skills might be group leaders, but make sure that they can help engage everybody else so their ideas are heard as well. Some people are going to understand themselves, um, and those people should be allowed to reflect on the work they've done, what it means to them, and what it means to you know, their, their overall performance. This is easier said than done, because some people, um, some people aren't as good as reflecting. They can't revisit the work that they did. They can't see how it helped them learn A, B, or C. So finding a way to quantify this and, and, and reward it can be quite challenging. So the last of Gardner's intelligence is, is, is the one related to nature, and that's really you know, related to science. Um, I always say you, know, you, can grow, you can grow trees, you could you know, have, have an open classroom with animals that, that are accessible to all students in the classroom. Um, gives them a chance to really use that intelligence for the better. So here's my question, you know, do we need, you know, do we need turnaround specialists to try to improve schools? Um, because every time we change schools, more stays the same with them as well. Do we need to focus on other elements to make our school system more sustainable? Um, is there a magic bullet? Is there a quick fix that's going to help us change schools and make them for the better? So the point of this class and what this class does, this class helps you understand theory. Theory is organized knowledge to explain why something happens. It can help inform, um, can change knowledge. Um, theories of action are ones that give rise to judgment on how the theory can help with practical problems. So what should theory do? If you are using an appropriate theory in your research, theory needs to do the four following things. It has to describe what's going on, it has to explain it well, big idea, it has to predict future events saying because this happened in this circumstance, not this is going to happen, but this, excuse me, this may happen in another, and it controls events. You need to focus on these four things when you're writing your case studies. That's what I'm looking for in your theory section. So this is an important slide. So theory of practice for educational leadership, um, you know, we're, we're in a profession where we have to help people understand on the pillars um, how adults work in school and understanding of the organizational context in which people work, what behavior of leaders looks like, and every theory that's presented in the book, like I keep saying, you're going to put this up against the wall and see what sticks. Find the theories and, and reflect on the ones that are best going to benefit you in your professional practice. So not every theory that we discuss in this class is going to be one you like. You have to find the one that fits first with you and then your organizational context. So this class is all about absorption. When all these videos are up and recorded, you can go through, you can look through the book, and you can find the ones that benefit you the most. Don't make your mind up right away. Absorb and figure out what best fits with your interests. So the next chapter really looks over um, organizational thought, um, but I think that's going to help you see why organizational behavior matters and why organizational theory matters. If you need anything else, please let me know. I hope you got something out of uh, this brief lecture on, uh, on, on basically the history of schools, traditional versus progressive education, and the history of the principalship. Thank you.